Trevin are doing gal Order, and I call the National Assembly to order. And the first agenda this afternoon are uh, questions to the First Minister. And the first question is in the name of Neil Hamilton. Uh, will the First Minister provide an update on what the Welsh Government is doing to assist with the GP crisis in Mid and West Wales? Yes, but we have increased investment on our modernising services through our primary care plan. We are working closely with health boards as well, who are responsible, of course, for providing services for their populations and who are responsible for ensuring continuity of high quality care when an independent general practice hands back its business contract. Well, I'm grateful to the First Minister for that reply, but as he knows, fine words butter no parsnips. And for people of Dwyfa Marionid, I don't think that they will derive much consolation from what he said, as he's aware. A surgery in Porth Madog, which serves 7,500 people, uh, recently announced that they would see only those who were acutely unwell. In Blaenau Festiniog, a practice of four doctors has now been reduced to one with a handful of locums, and often there's nobody available. Over half the GPs in Dover are over 55. Is it not time for the government actually to get its act together and make a health service fit for the people of Wales in the area of Dover Marionis? Well, these are independent contractors, and they are entitled, of course, to seek help from the uh, local health boards. And indeed, where uh, those contractors have decided they no longer wish to provide that service. The health boards across Wales have taken over and provided an equally good, if not better, service, as the people of Prostatin will, uh, will explain to the member. Uh, but yes, we know that there are difficulties in recruiting GPs. It's not a, an issue that's confined to Wales. It happens in England and in Northern Ireland, Scotland, for that matter, as well. Uh, we are uh, looking to launch a GP recruitment campaign next month uh, in order to make sure uh, that we uh, can uh, once again portray Wales as a good place to be uh, a doctor uh, and of course that we can provide the flexibility that the profession now needs moving uh, not necessarily towards the independent contractor model as the default model but to look at other models as well. Joyce Watson. Uh, to ask Clareth, uh, I was also busy meeting uh, health forums in the summer uh, uh, First Minister, and I did ask a question uh, last July uh, where you quite clearly answered me in regard to the dualised valley that you're bringing forward uh, very shortly proposals for a national and an international campaign to market Wales and the NHS as an attractive place to work, and that that work would include, uh, include recruitment and training and retention of GPs. Um, could I uh, ask you, therefore, uh, First Minister, whether there is uh, progress uh, that has been taken forward through the summer? Well, yes, I can confirm that next month we will be launching a national and international marketing campaign to highlight Wales as a great place to train, work and live. And the Secretary will be outlining the campaign in his statement next week. It will be a step change in the way we market Wales to aid doctor and GP recruitment. Simon Thomas. Uh, well. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, for the communities from Porth Madog, Newtown, Cardigan, Temby, Pembroke Dock, Pembroke, all of those communities that have to wait a fortnight these days for an appointment with a GP do feel that there is a crisis and they feel that there is a problem of recruitment and a shortage of GPs who are willing to stay in that area. And there are particular problems in terms of those who want to become partners in surgeries. So what in addition can the government do to recruit GPs, but also what is the future of the private surgery as part of the health service for primary care? Well, it, when you mention private surgeries, uh, uh, are you talking about the independent well, contractors? Yes. Well, model, that, of course, is the current model and for some it could be the future model. model. But I don't believe that it is board. the sole model that you can have as regards GPs, because more and more GPs want to be salaried. They wish to have the opportunity to move from one practice to another, and that, of course, is something which is a professional has to deal with. We are working with the BMA and the Royal College in order to ensure that the campaign that we will launch next month will be the most effective possible. And of course, we expect the health boards to work with the GPs because when problems have been uh, highlighted, we must ensure that uh, doctors come in as locums if that's what needs to happen temporarily in order to secure a sustainable future for surgeries. 
Cry to make sure that the Maltese make sure that more and more people just wish to work in Wales and also to ensure that there are plenty of models available for them to work in Wales. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, given that we now have three health boards that have targeted intervention and one health board in special measures, this drive to recruit GPs has to talk about recruiting the whole family because otherwise these GPs will not want to work in areas where they feel that there is not going to be substantial backup medically for them in their practices. And we need to make sure that these GPs who want to come to Wales, and you're right, it's a great place to live and work, but they'll want to bring their families, they'll want to bring their spouses, their partners, their children, they'll want them to have good schools to go to, and they'll want to have good jobs that their partners, their spouses, can also undertake. Because it's not just one person we're recruiting, but an entire family, and if we can get that family over the border we can keep them but we've got to give them that whole package so when you look at this retention uh, program and recruitment program will you please bear that in mind and bear in mind that all these GP practices whether they're health board driven or individual uh, private members they will be looking to their hospitals and to the local NHS for the service they need to back up their support for their patients and with four out of eight in uh, some kind of trouble it's not good news well, I mean, what we do know is we don't have a funding uh, crisis in acute hospitals as England does or a doctor's strike. But she does make a very important point, if I may, uh, with respect to the member, in the sense that it is absolutely right that you have to target the family. Uh, for many, many years ago, GPs would come to an area and quite often they had a spouse who wasn't working. That's no longer the case. So being able to provide opportunities for a partner uh, and a good environment for children is important. And that will be very much part of the campaign that uh, we're launching in October. Question die, Beth Ann Jenkins. Question two, Beth Ann Jenkins. Can the First Minister give the latest information on the support the Welsh uh, Government is giving to the steel industry in Wales? Yes, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Infrastructure sent members a full update yesterday on the progress that's been made since the written statement on the 8th of August. Uh, no progress has yet been made, however, by the UK Government in terms of the issues of energy and pensions. Um, thank you uh, for the um, answer, and I did get that statement, and in that uh, letter from the Minister it says good progress is being made on a range of projects which, which will allow the Welsh plants to become more efficient and capable of withstanding the global competition, including developing a major environmental improvement project for Portalbert, as well as the research and development investment projects in Portalbert. These are, I believe, um, if I am understood correctly, to be um, Plaid Cymru ideas um, that you have taken on board. Um, I wonder whether you would like to give us information on the development of the power plant and also the research and development activities at Swansea University, which we've proposed to you and you've kindly taken on board. Yeah. I, I, I don't think the, uh, the, the principle of keeping our steel industry was wholly a Ply Cymru idea. The issue of the power plant is something we've been discussing for years, uh, right. with Tata, long before go. actually, the, uh, the, the, what happened at the beginning of, of this year. What I can say, well, there's a limit to what I can say at this stage because Negotiations are still ongoing, but good progress has been made as far as we are concerned as a government uh, to seeking to provide a platform for the long-term future of our steel industry. But it is true to say, of course, that those two issues of energy and pensions are still not resolved at UK government level. David Rees. Thank you for that answer. And we are seeing in Welsh Government support for the steel industry through those projects, which I very much welcome in Patola. But, but also we've seen over the summer since we last met financial improvements in the steel industry in Portalbert as well, where we saw losses being discussed of a million pounds a day beforehand, and we're now turning into profits in a month. So we, I think it was five million in uh, July, and perhaps we will be working even in August. So we are seeing progress in steel making in Wales. It's viable, as we said. But when you met the, the Prime Minister, you talked about the steel, and you've already highly partly mentioned this afternoon, the issue of the UK government's position. Did she indicate that they would actually be working to improve the situation with the British Steel Pensions Fund? And also, are they making any movements towards the energy costs? Because they were the big issues that any particular prospective buyer had concerns about. It's true. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the previous Prime Minister was very proactive in this regard. Uh, we've not heard as much from the current government in terms of these two issues. But there have been initial conversations. They've, they've not been negative. Uh, but I think we need now the next uh, few months to see some progress, particularly on the issue of pensions uh, and on the issue, of course, of, of energy prices, a long-held long issue. Uh, we, we have correspondence going back five years with the UK government on the issue of energy prices, not just for the steel industry, but for all our energy-intensive industries. We cannot afford to be seen as an expensive place to manufacture because of our energy prices. 
Susie Davis. Uh, following representation by the Prime Minister Theresa May, the G20 uh, members agreed to set up a forum to tackle the issues of overcapacity and production in the global steel market. So the UK is moving ahead and getting world leaders uh, to confront and answer the central question, as well as dealing with the, uh, the issues that, uh, that they've already been acting on until recently. Now, I accept that the Welsh Government has a more limited role. I do accept that, but it can make a practical difference in my region. Pulling out of a deal that could have saved 200 jobs at Fairwood Fabrications, part of the steel industry supply chain connected with Patol, but probably wasn't helpful. So can you tell us specifically what you're doing to assist stability in the Welsh steel supply chain? Thank you. Well, more than anything else, what we're doing is uh, assisting Tata, looking at ways where they can save money, particularly with regard to the uh, power plant, uh, seeing what we can do in terms of... Uh, skills and training and providing the support that, that they need in order to be sustainable in the in the longer term. Uh, there are issues regarding other uh, businesses that had their issues with Tata, uh, which unfortunately led to the consequences that we, um, uh, that, we that the member has mentioned, but, but we are confident that we can put together a, a good package as far as Tata is concerned in terms of what we can offer, but we do now need to see progress on the two major issues uh, and we need to see that progress pretty soon. Caroline Jones. Uh, First Minister, Welsh Steel and other energy intensive industries are suffering as a result of EU imposed carbon reduction policies, which have resulted in higher energy bills. In order to secure the future of Welsh Steel, particularly the Tata plant at Port Talbot in my region, we have to drop EU legislation which pushes up our energy costs. First Minister, do you agree with me that the best support the Welsh Government can give the Welsh steel industry is to press the UK Government to complete the Brexit process as soon as possible? You know, the biggest threat in the steel industry is, is tariffs. I mean, we, are ex we export 30% of the steel that we produce, and anything that increases the price of that steel is not going to be helpful. If she's talking about carbon reduction, what she means is more emissions. So more coming out of the, uh, of the steel that's than before. And if she wants to sell that to the people of Patola and Bridget, she's welcome to do it. Uh, and indeed, I'm sure there'll be opportunities this week where she can explain that policy to people in, in the area that she doesn't want to see uh, emissions controlled properly. But there's another point here as well. If you look at other countries in the EU, their energy prices are much lower than ours. If you look at Germany, 20% lower. If you look at Spain, 37% lower. So it's nothing to do with the EU at all. It's to do with the UK and the UK's alleged energy market. Every single energy intensive industry is, is saying to us that, that it's not a, an EU issue. It's the fact that the UK's energy, uh, energy industry is not transparent enough. And it's, an, it's something that, that Celsa Steel have raised, raised with me along with others. They say, look, the UK is an expensive place to do business because of its energy costs. Now, the regulations are the same across the, the entire EU, but the fact remains that the UK is more expensive than many other of our competitive countries, and that has to change. Uh, that's not to do with emissions, because Germany and Spain have the same regulations. It's to do with the way that the market operates in the UK. Dear uh, Clareth, uh, First Minister, as you are aware, the plants in Newport East, my constituency, at the Orb Works and Llan Wern, are very important parts of the overall Tata operations in <laughs> Wales. Will you assure me that the, those plants will continue to be properly considered in Welsh Government's thoughts and actions to ensure a sustainable steel industry in Wales? Uh, absolutely. The, the, the four major sites are hugely important. Shotton as well, of course, uh, and, and Trostre. They, they are operations that we want to keep in Wales, uh, producing steel in Wales, exporting steel uh, from Wales. Port Talbot, of course, has had the most focus uh, because it is the biggest plant and, it, and it's had the, uh, the, the greatest challenges, but all four plants are important for the future of Wales. Anna Blyden. Yeah. Um, I welcome Tata's August announcement of investment in the Shotton site to create the next generation of steel coating. And I spent a day there just after the announcement. I know the workforce is appreciative of the proactive approach by the Welsh Government in securing this investment. But as you've already alluded to, I urge the Welsh Government going forward to make sure we consider that, that a successful and profitable site like Shotton is as integral to any discussions on the future of the steel industry going forward. No, absolutely. And I've been, of course, to all four sites. Shotton is, is, uh, always was a profitable site. Uh, but as it was said to me in Shotton, it would be very difficult for Shotton to operate without the steel from Patalbot. 
because uh, it would take about six months to source the steel from somewhere else if the Talbot wasn't there, uh, with an obvious uh, knock-on effect in terms of loss of customers. So all four of our steel plants are integrated with each other. Hugely important then that they all stand together and prosper. Question in our Ghana. We now move to questions from the party leaders, and first of all, leader of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Thank you, uh, The First Minister and I will be able to agree uh, on one thing, at least, in congratulating Wales' athletes on their performance in the Olympic Games and uh, having won so many gold medals. I don't expect him to agree with me, though, that uh, he should and his administration should get the wooden spoon for pouring cold water on Wales' chances of hosting the bid for the Commonwealth Games here in 2026. Well, the, the, the cost involved is some £1.5 billion. Uh, at this moment in time, that is a cost that would mean that there will be no money to support major events for the next decade in Wales, pretty much. Uh, the Scots were able to host the Games at, at a cheaper price because they didn't have to build as much as we would have to build. We'd have to build a new athletic stadium, build a new velodrome, build a new pool or extend the pool that we actually have at the moment. So the, the, the capital costs are actually huge, which is why, of course, it makes it very difficult for the Commonwealth Games to go to smaller countries these days. Now, what we wanted uh, was to put in an all Wales bid. That wasn't uh, looked at favourably. Or, or indeed, to launch a joint bid with, um, with cities in England. But again, that's not possible under the current rules uh, that, that operate with Commonwealth Games bids. What I prefer to see in the future is, is to explore ways which we, we could bid with other Commonwealth countries in order to host the Games. <clears throat> well, uh, of course I accept the point about uh, the capital costs of uh, improving Wales' infrastructure, but uh, that's justifiable in its own right. Uh, we're talking about here probably something of the order of one to £1.5 billion pounds amortised over 10 years in the first instance. In the context of a Welsh government budget of £15 billion a year, we're talking about peanuts. What I'm asking the uh, First Minister to do is to raise his sights and raise his game and promote Wales to the world through the exploits of our athletes. And what we need is action from our government to match that in improving Wales's sporting infrastructure so that we can host the Games in 2026. I don't think 10% of our budget is peanuts with respect to the, uh, <laughs> to, to, to the member. Uh, there's a significant opportunity cost. For example, we've been hugely successful over many years in attracting major events to Wales. We have the Champions League final coming next year and the Women's Champions League final. We've had the Ryder Cup. Uh, we have the Speedway every year, we've had the Rugby League World Cup, Rugby Union World Cup, we've had major cricket matches, and all this is done with money. That money would no longer be available for any of those events if we were to host the, um, the Commonwealth Games. Much better to my mind that we use that money to uh, bring in events such as, as those. The Champions League final, for example, is an enormously useful way of promoting Wales. It is the largest single sporting event in the world. Uh, now, if we were to... Uh, go for the Commonwealth Games, the money wouldn't be there to attract events like that in the future. Well, I'm sorry to say that the First Minister seems to have a rather static view of his functions as, uh, uh, as First Minister. Uh, why don't we take a more dynamic view of these projects? Uh, other countries do, and they can see the advantages of raising our aspirations. Uh, you know, this is uh, in a long line of projects which the government has poured cold water on, M4 improvements, Circuit of Wales, now the Commonwealth Games bid. These are all projects which are too difficult, too hard, kick them into the long grass, ultimately do nothing. Well, it's not good enough to have a do-nothing administration here in Cardiff Bay. Well, I mean, the, the member seems to have a, a particularly delusional view of money, if I may say, because you know, it is a significant uh, financial commitment that it would have involved and uh, it would have meant uh, that we would not have been able to host many, many events in the future. It would have a knock-on effect on our capital budgets. Uh, much better to invest, to look at investing in grassroots sport. Yes, in, in building up infrastructure, that much is, is true. Uh, we need, for example, to look at a velodrome with seats, which we don't have. We need to look at, at the, uh, the national pool. It doesn't have seats. They have a diving pool. That needs to be improved in the future. But the, but the costs he's talking about are huge. And uh, from the, pers the perspective we have taken, we've looked at all the options of the Commonwealth Games, looked at hosting the Games with somebody else, and those options were closed off to us. Much better, then, that we're able to use that money for events such as the Champions League final, which will actually broadcast Wales to a huge audience around the world. Leader of the Opposition, Leanne Wood. Dear Llywydd, First Minister, the terms upon which we leave the European Union will define the future of the Welsh economy and indeed all of Welsh politics. You've said that Wales should have a veto if the Brexit deal uh, isn't a good one for Wales. Now, it's one thing to call for a veto, 
But what we need to see now is vision, and people are looking to you for that comprehensive, detailed, inspiring vision of what Wales looks like after we leave the European Union. Fighting for what we've already got in terms of funding isn't sufficient. That would just deliver the bare minimum, and it's just not good enough. When, First Minister, can we expect to hear your vision as to what a new Wales will look like after we leave the European Union, or don't you have one? Well, it'll be a Wales, of course, that is still very much part of Europe, Wales that it looks outwards uh, and continues to be successful in attracting investment. That's the message I took the US uh, last week. Uh, from my perspective, it's hugely important that we have tariff-free access to the market in goods and services that would not be to our advantage if tariffs were to be imposed. Yes, um, in, co in keeping with the promise that was made by those in the UK government now, we want to make sure that Wales does not lose out a penny. That much is, is true. What needs to be explored now is what kind of model we need. Is it the EEA model? Is it the EFTA model? Is it a customs union model? Is it a free trade agreement model? Those are the four models that, that deliver at least partial access to the, uh, to the single market. The WTO model doesn't work, to my mind, as far as Wales is concerned. But we do need to understand, first of all, that the UK government will keep to its commitment that the devolved governments will be at the heart of negotiations, not at the end of negotiations. It also means the UK government itself has to work out what, what it wants. You know, it's talked about a bespoke deal, fine, but what are the elements of that deal that, they, that the, the UK government sees as essential? For me, funding and access to the single market are, are fundamental. Without them, Wales would undoubtedly lose out. There needs to be an examination of what it means for freedom of movement as far as people are concerned. We know that many, many people voted to leave because of that issue, and that needs to be handled carefully in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of the public view. The next steps are the Cabinet subcommittee met yesterday uh, to, uh, to look at the initial challenges that Brexit uh, presents, and the external advisory group, which uh, I'm putting in place, will meet at the end of the month. First Minister, that isn't a vision. You've uh, outlined the next steps. You've outlined what you'd like to see the Prime Minister do, but you haven't told us what you want to see for Wales. Now, there have been mixed messages coming from your UK leader on this question of single market membership, yeah. and your own statements have not been much clearer either. You've called for free access to the European single market. You've also said that you want uninterrupted access. And last week, you said that you want to see a seven-year moratorium on the free movement of people. Well, I was in Brussels last week with a number of members from my team, and it was made absolutely clear to us that you can't have complete free access without accepting free movement of people. Now, access can include all kinds of costs, including tariffs, and we've heard today how that would be bad for steel. It could mean custom charges, all of which would be against Wales's best interests. First Minister, do you believe that Wales should remain as a member of the single market when we leave the European Union? Yes, I've said that many times. Thank you for clarity on that point, First Minister. <laughs> You, you, contradicted, you contradicted that position last week. So, finally, we have clarity. I'm grateful to you for that. Last night, your Labour MPs, Welsh Labour MPs, voted against a Welsh legal jurisdiction. The amendment that Labour voted against was from your very own Government and Laws in Wales Bill, and that's not the first time that has happened. When they voted against Plaid Cymru back in uh, July, you said that the problem there was a matter of timing and not a matter of principle. Why can't you influence your colleagues in Westminster, First Minister? Well, two things. First of all, I, I have probably lost count of the times I've said that access to the single market is hugely important for Wales. It must be uninterrupted. So access the leader of the opposition to say membership. that somehow this is I new. I mean, membership. she clearly hasn't been uh, following the media You're or the debates for the past two or three months. And so access to the single market for goods and services on a tariff-free basis is absolutely crucial. I've been saying that, well, ad, ad nauseam. Secondly, of course, uh, what happens in Westminster is a matter in Westminster. We have taken a view that a distinct jurisdiction, at the very least, is hugely important. And without that distinct jurisdiction, there cannot be a lasting devolution settlement for Wales. 
leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew Arty Davis. First Minister, uh, last week you were in America promoting what Wales has to offer to businesses who are looking to invest into the UK, and Wales uh, obviously wants to get a big share of that cake. Uh, at the end of the visit, you chose to actually use a speech to talk about the breakup of the United Kingdom, uh, which did seem rather odd when you're trying to promote the product to entrepreneurs who are looking to invest hundreds of millions of uh, dollars into the UK with a bit of luck, that you, on the Friday, were talking down the prospects of the United Kingdom. Can you explain why you used a trade mission to use it as a platform about the breakup of the United Kingdom? What I didn't say, of course, is that those in business were fat, lazy golfers, which is uh, the theme uh, of his party at the moment. Uh, the party of business. You couldn't make it up, could you? That, that, that's what uh, one, of his, one of the senior Brexiteers actually said. I wonder if he's actually read my speech. Because I made it very, very clear that there were challenges as far as Brexit were concerned. I outlined a way forward up with those challenges. I also said it was hugely important that the UK's architecture was examined to make sure that the UK is robust after Brexit. And that is something I've said many, many times. The audience was hugely interested in that. First Minister, it clearly came over that you were fantasising again about the breakup of the United Kingdom, which is something you spend a lot of time talking about these days. And as anyone who goes before an entrepreneur, such as in Dragon's Den, you don't go and diss the product you're trying to sell to them, you don't, First Minister. But one thing you could have done on your trade mission is gone over to Detroit and actually spoken at Ford headquarters to the directors there and the senior management team about the announcement that was made last week about cutting back of production at the Bajend engine facility. I think we should remember there's still £100 million worth of investment going into that engine facility, uh, but this is a significant announcement on behalf of Ford how they're going to take forward the uh, dynamics of that plant. Did you request a meeting with Ford? And if you did request that meeting, uh, why wasn't it granted? Yes, we did request a meeting, but uh, we were told it was now a matter for Ford Europe and the meeting should be with them. So the, the request was made to have a meeting with them. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the comment he made earlier on, it's quite clear that he hasn't read my speech, has he, in Chicago? Clearly, he's just picked up on what... When he, when he said, you gave the impression that he said a yeah. certain thing, that's, that's code for, oh, I haven't read the speech. Yeah. Uh, I've picked it up uh, from what I've seen uh, online. Well, can I suggest he reads the speech? Uh, it, was, it was read with some interest by uh, people who were there, and he will see it's not quite what he makes it out uh, to be. Uh, like him, I want to make sure the UK uh, is intact in the future, but it will need changes. It can't carry on as it is uh, when there are so many changes that, that will come down the line when we leave the EU. When I spoke to businesses in America, every single one of them wanted to know what happened next to Brexit. Every single one of them. It was the theme as far as American investors were concerned. And I was able to say to them that my view was that it was hugely important that we have access to the single market on a tariff-free basis. It certainly gave them relief. They were happy to, 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 to hear that because they had not heard it from the UK government. So it's hugely important that the UK government now makes sure that it has a coherent view rather than, as we saw the Foreign Secretary doing this week, launching a pressure group to pressure his own Prime Minister to do something. You know, we do need to see coherence and unity in the UK government for the sake of the people of Britain. First Minister, I regret that Ford in Detroit weren't prepared to meet you because, as I understand it, that's where the decision about the investment was taken and they seem to have passed the ball back to Ford Europe on this matter. But there are three very legitimate questions which I hope your government and yourself as First Minister has been interacting with Ford on, and that is how, going forward, can the jobs be secured with such a dramatic uh, cutback in production at the plant? Also, what new lines potentially could come to the plant to secure the 1,850 jobs that are currently at the site? And it is fair to say the Welsh Government have put money on the table to retain jobs at the engine plant uh, at a level of 850 jobs, as I understand it. Uh, obviously, there are 1,850 jobs on that site at the moment. So what assurances can you give around the discussions that the Welsh Government have had around future job security, around new products coming to the plant, and above all, about the future viability of the plant as a working entity within the Ford manufacturing capacity of the United Kingdom? When I was at the plant, it was made absolutely clear to me that tariffs were the issue. Yeah. The plant is, is the most efficient plant, engine plant, that Ford have. The workforce there is excellent, but they export every engine they make. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wholly export driven. Tariffs would mean a 5% component tariff going uh, to the assembly plant and possibly a 10% tariff coming back in again to the UK. It's a 15% tariff. Uh, nobody can, uh, can cope with that. Many businesses in the States said the same thing to me. They're waiting to see what happens with regard to what the UK does. I'll be, I'll, I'll be straight with him. 
I think if we, if we manage to secure tariff-free access to the European market, I think the problem is resolved. That is what, the, what business in, investors are looking for. They're all European operations. They don't see the UK as a, they see the UK as part of a European operation. Anything that puts a barrier between the UK and the rest of the European operation is bad for the UK operation. So the Ford workforce are excellent, they're efficient, but they cannot be put in a situation where tariff barriers would interfere with the future viability of the plant, which is why I've been absolutely clear that whatever model the UK adopts, and there are models, four different models that could be adopted that give you know, pretty much full access to the European market, single market, that the UK government needs to declare that position now in order to give that certainty, not just to Ford, but to all our investors from overseas. Question three, Nick Question three, Nick Ramsey. Oh. Will the First Minister provide an update on the development of the South Wales Metro? Yes, the procurement for the operator and development partner for the Wales and Borders <coughs> franchise, which includes the Metro, uh, has started and subject to a successful competition. The contract will be awarded at the end of next year. Uh, thank, thank you, First Minister. Our rail network has clearly been uppermost in the minds of my constituents and other AMs over the last few days with the start of the six-week closure period of the Seven Tunnel for the important electrification work. Speed of travel is a key aspect of our quality of life, so I was very concerned to hear that the town of Monmouth may not be part of the future metro map following funding concerns in the wake of the European <coughs> vote. How can you reassure my constituents that the metro scheme will reach all parts of South East Wales so that no one feels excluded? And is the government looking at all metro options in rural areas, including enhanced bus services and busways? We have no plans to change the uh, current proposals for the metro, and he will know, of course, that Mammoth is part of the, uh, the, uh, the metro in terms of its future development. What is correct, however, is that £125 million worth of the funding for the metro is due to be met by European funding. Now, without that funding, clearly there will be a limit on how far and how fast the Metro project can proceed. Now, I've heard what was said, that Wales would uh, not lose out as a result of leaving the EU. Indeed, I know that it has been said that funding for each and every part of the UK, including Wales, would be safe if we vote to leave. Uh, Andrew R.T. Davis, uh, 14th of June. So he has his own leader's assurance that that 100, 125 million pounds will still be available for the Metro, and I'm sure that he will, that he will receive that uh, assurance with some comfort. Jeremy Miles. Yeah, with First Minister, uh, several of us on these benches are also members of the uh, Cooperative Party and spent part of the weekend discussing the role of co-ops and social enterprises in the Welsh economy. Do you agree it would be a positive outcome to see not-for-profits, social enterprises and co-ops involved integrally in the delivery of various aspects of the South Wales Metro? Well, absolutely. I mean, we want to see a, a model that uh, invests, of course, in the network itself uh, and a model that provides a uh, good service to uh, passengers at a, a fair uh, price. And uh, these are the issues that we will be exploring as the, uh, the Metro uh, procurement process goes ahead. The First Minister dismissed suggestions that within the economic plan for the capital region and the proposed metro that a distinct status should be afforded to the City of Newport and other centres outside Cardiff itself. Will the First Minister therefore confirm that his plans for the capital region amount to no more than making a commute to Cardiff easier rather than a comprehensive plan to, to spread job creation opportunities across the entire South East? No, I mean, the, uh, of course, Newport and uh, the Valleys are part of the region because it is an economic region. The reality is that 11 million people region. a year come through no, Cardiff no. Central Station. They're commuters, many of them, who come down from Valley communities. He is right to, to ask the question, of course, is this simply about bringing people from Valley communities to Cardiff? That's half the story. The other half of the story is to make it easier for investors to move their investments up into Valley communities as it becomes, in their minds, easier to get there. It has to be a two-way flow for the... Uh, for the region to operate effectively. David Rowlands. Uh, whilst my party broadly welcomes the Metro project, uh, closer inspection makes it difficult to envisage any real advantage it brings to the conurbations of the Eastern Valleys. Could the First Minister comment where, if any, improvements are envisaged to enhance connectivity for this area? Well, first of all, of course, uh, we have the existing rail network into, uh, into Cardiff, and that offers us the opportunity to examine uh, how those networks can be uh, made quicker in the future. But the point about the metro is that it's extendable. It's not about simply looking at the, the, the structure that we have at the moment. The metro in future will, I've no doubt, include new light rail lines. 
new bus connectivity, particularly Cross Valley, where of course it's quite difficult and everything tends to go north-south. Uh, so the East, Eastern Cardiff is in the same situation, of course. Eastern Cardiff is poorly served by the, by the rail network. And as the Metro rolls out, uh, we're fully aware of the fact we need to look at these areas where certainly rail transport is uh, non-existent or there's little of it to make sure that those gaps are filled in the future. Question, Pedwar, Neil Mac Question for Neil McAvoy. If, um, does the First Minister stand by his position from 2012 that it is appropriate for Cardiff Council to have plans to build tens of thousands of new houses within the city's boundaries with a large number of those on green fields? I have never taken such a position. Well, First Minister, you said on the 14th of June that I lived in a land of fantasy for the past three years. Well, you know, I took it hard, so did some more, did some more research and found the, the South Hills Echo from the 5th of April 2012, where you were quoted announcing that Labour would introduce a local development plan under the current system, page five. Now, the South Wales Echo, in its editorial, said that the newspaper firmly disagreed with you, that tens of thousands of houses had to be built within the city's limits. The reported comments, which you have subsequently denied. So my question is, what was the editor of the South Wales Echo also living in a land of fantasy? And do you stand by your comments on the matter made in this chamber? No, because I never make comments on LDPs or planning applications, is the whole point of being in government. The reason why the story appeared in the paper in that way is because he put it there. <laughs> so that's the reason for it. I, you know, I, I give him his due, he, he's you know, tell you like he's, he's still at it, but I, I never make any comment on any LDP anywhere in Wales as far as uh, whether they should go ahead or not. There's a proper procedure for doing that. David Melding. First Minister, I, I don't know if I'm going to come to your aid, but anyway, let me uh, just remind the Chamber that over the, last, over the last 15 years, we've built on average 8,000 homes a year in Wales, when uh, trends indicated that we needed to build 12,000 homes a year to keep up with demand. Uh, if we have any catch-up, we probably need to go beyond 12,000 homes a year. And the sad fact is, if we don't face up to the housing shortage and crisis, it's young people after family homes that would be denied decent living conditions that most of us would have enjoyed in our upbringings. It's true, it's true to say that uh, demand has exceeded supply for many, many years, particularly affordable housing. And of course, that housing has to go where it's needed. It can't be put where you know, people don't, where, where the demand is low. It has to go where demand is, is highest. And they're very difficult decisions for local authorities in terms of where, uh, how they meet that demand uh, locally in terms of, of housing, and they're sometimes not without controversy, but the member's right to say that we have to make sure that we have enough houses available for the people who need them. Gareth Bennett. Uh, dear Clarif, um I won't go into the issue of um, what the First Minister did or didn't say in 2012, um, but there is, an Im there is an important issue here regarding overdevelopment of Cardiff and major housing developments which have been proposed and are likely to go ahead, which go against the wishes of most of the current residents of the city. Does the First Minister agree that there is a problem with the lack of accountability of the planning system in Wales, particularly with planning inspectorate, and should we make moves in the Assembly to dilute the powers of the planning inspectorate in Wales? No, I don't. I think there has to be a process of examination that is, that is robust. Cardiff is a growing city. Uh, its population has expanded uh, mightily over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, and how you deal with that demand is not simply a matter for Cardiff, it's a matter for all of the authorities around Cardiff, because we know that uh, uh, that uh, demand will be there outside of the city boundaries as, as well. But I, we're never going to get to a position where uh, we're not building any houses, because that would mean that the demand isn't being satisfied. So for local authorities, uh, they have to uh, produce a local development plan, uh, put forward the evidence uh, for their plans, have those plans tested by a, a planning inspector, and I think that's a robust system to make sure that an LDP uh, is, has been tested as rigorously and as thoroughly as possible in the future. Question Pimp Lee Waters. Question 5 Lee Waters. First Minister, will you provide an update on the Welsh Government's progress in recruiting more GPs? 
Well, plans to recruit and train additional GPs and other primary healthcare professionals is uh, a priority. And of course, I've uh, gone in, in, in some length in terms of what we're planning to do across Wales uh, in my answer to question one. Thank you, First Minister. There's understandable concern in Kidwele, First Minister, about the difficulty in recruiting and retaining GPs in the Minavon surgery. And local Labour councillors have been working hard with the Health Board to try and inform the community. And in fairness to Howard Dahl, they've been trying their best to try and recruit a clinical team to the surgery and to bring in locums. I was very pleased to hear the Welsh Government are planning a recruitment campaign uh, later in the year. Uh, it's essential that uh, the Welsh Government works with health boards and they're not left to run their own campaigns in isolation. Would he give us some uh, details about his thoughts in adapting the model uh, that the GPs currently have uh, in, in building up their own surgeries and buying into them? Because quite clearly the needs of modern GPs are more diverse and that seems essential to attracting GPs to places like Kidwele. They are. I, mean, I understand that, that two locum GPs have been recruited to replace the uh, two salary GPs in Kidwele that, uh, that handed in their notice and the service has been resumed. What I notice with many younger GPs is they're not interested in buying into a practice. Uh, they want to be salaried. They want to have the flexibility. Well, first of all, they've got the money. You know, raising the money to buy into a practice is, is tricky for them. Uh, and also, of course, they want to have the flexibility of being able to move around. Uh, the, the days when GPs went somewhere and stayed there for all their working lives, well, there are fewer and fewer, I suspect, who want to, want to do that. And the, you know, the NHS has to adapt to that, uh, to that reality. It means, for example, that where health boards take over surgeries, in fact, the, quite often the service is enhanced as a result of it. And Prostatin is a good example of that. Where there's another practice that wishes to take over, that's facilitated. There have to be a number of different models in the future to make sure that uh, general practice is seen as attractive, rather than the one traditional model, which will be attractive to some, but not all. Rina Piorwerth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I last week met with a number of GPs from Anglesey and we discussed how we could encourage more young people to aspire to a career as a GP and I'm sure that the First Minister will share my concern about the reduction of 15% in the number of Welsh domicile students who have been applying to study medicine, but I'm sure he would also support my call and the BMA and others' calls for the training of more Welsh domicile students in Wales. Now, the figures demonstrate that 80% of medical students in Northern Ireland are from Northern Ireland, some 50% of medic medical students from Scot in Scotland are from Scotland, and only some 20% of medical students in Wales coming from Wales. Now, does the First Minister agree with me that we need to change that percentage and that that does have to include an element of quotas? Well, I think it's fair to make that point. I would wish to see more young people training in Wales. I have heard anecdotally that of people that have been given an offer from a medical school in England, but not uh, received one from a medical school in Wales, and that is a cause of concern. But first of all, we must ensure that more and more young people wish to become doctors and also ensure that there is more of an opportunity for them to train in Wales. I do understand that where you train has a great impact on where you work later on. They go hand in hand. Finch Saunders. With First Minister, the planned primary care workforce for Wales referenced the emerging role of physicians' associations and our medical schools as a way of boosting the numbers of GPs in Wales. Um, Given the undeniable crisis of GP provision now in Wales, um, how have you taken this recommendation forward? And what plans do you have in place to increase on just 27 funded places available through our medical schools here in Wales? Well, well first of all, if there's a crisis in Wales, there's a crisis across the rest of Britain, uh, because it's no different here compared to elsewhere. It is difficult to do uh, and challenging to attract GPs. We know that which is why, of course, the campaign is being launched in October. Uh, it's not simply about opportunity, not simply about flexibility. It's also about providing, as the, the member for Command of West and South Pembrokeshire has said, uh, providing the right environment for their, their wider family as well. And uh, the statement that the, um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will make will, uh, will outline in detail uh, how that campaign will proceed. Nathan Gill. Thank you. First Minister, I met last Thursday with Gary Doherty, the um, Chief Executive of the Betsy Cadwell Health Board, and he confirmed to me that 
The biggest challenge that he has in North Wales is the recruitment and retention of doctors, GPs, and also nurses. Now, one of the things that we discussed about was the possibility of actually training Welsh-speaking medical staff in Ysbyty Gwynedd and also attached to Bangor University. Do you agree that this is a good idea? This would be a way for us to encourage more people to study in Wales and to stay in Wales, but also to help with the, the dearth, the problem that we have of Welsh-speaking professionals in the health service. Would you be willing to speak with Lord David Ellis Thomas, who is the yeah. uh, Chancellor of the Bangor University, and also speak with Gary Doherty, who agreed with me that this was a good idea? Well, we're open to any suggestions. What's important, of course, is that any medical school can give the full uh, opportunity of training to uh, to a student. This is one issue, of course, that has been raised before, if, if this can be done in, in Bangor. Uh, it's not entirely in our hands. The deanery, of course, uh, would have a view on that, as would those responsible for uh, medical training more widely. Uh, it's, it's right to say that it's a challenge to recruit uh, in, in all parts of the UK. And what is absolutely crucial at this stage as well is we don't give the impression that we don't want doctors and nurses from outside the UK. They are crucial to the health service. Uh, if we, uh, often from outside the EU. We know that the market for medics is international. It always will be. You can never train people who will then stay entirely for their working lives in the country where they were trained. So you have to appeal internationally as well and make sure people feel welcome. Question Mark Ishwood. Six, Mark Ishwood. Will the First Minister outline the Welsh Government plans for future transport provision in North Wales? Uh, we're taking a number of actions to improve all modes of transport provision uh, in the north, and the planned Metro North Wales project will bring further improvement. How do you respond to um, the submission by user groups in North East Wales to the Welsh Affairs Committee inquiry on the um, Wales and Borders uh, franchise devolution uh, to Wales, uh, that English bodies such as Rail North must have devolved franchise responsibility alongside the Welsh Government for those cross-border services such as Wrexham Bidston into England which remain in the devolved franchise? Well, it's difficult, of course, to draw an absolute line given the nature of the Wales and Borders franchise. What I would not agree with is that one suggestion that did come from the Department of Transport that any service that terminated in England should be run from England. That would mean that literally no service uh, running across the uh, anywhere uh, in North Wales except the Conway Valley line would, would be wow. controlled from Wales at all. Uh, same, exactly the same for the, for the uh, Central Wales Railway, the Heart of Wales Railway, many of the Cambrian Coast services as well, as well as intercity services and many, many of the services <coughs> that run to, to Manchester, that run to, uh, at the moment, beyond the, uh, beyond the border. That would be wholly unacceptable. So whilst uh, we want to make sure that, that the Wales and Border Service, with its franchise, is run from Wales, uh, we, we believe we can provide an equally good service to people living in England as well. Question Scythe. Question seven, Lear Griffith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on public transport in North Wales? Well, I believe that I answered uh, you in the last question. Well, yes, we've discussed the South Wales Metro a fair bit earlier in the session, and your party published a plan for a metro for the North East to all intents and purposes, and there were lines on a map, and many stakeholders have given their opinion on that. But... Uh, isn't um, talking about a metro just empty talk when the basic services aren't being provided, such as the failure of GHA coaches? And would you accept that there are questions that your government should answer from the fact that the government knew months in advance that the company was facing financial difficulties, very serious financial difficulties? The company wasn't saved, of course, but what disappointed many people was that there weren't alternative arrangements in place immediately after the company went bust. There are still people who can't travel to work in Wrexham, can't travel to education in Wrexham because of those services lost. That isn't good enough, is it? That is the responsibility of local authorities, not the Welsh Government. But on a broader point, it is crucial to ensure that this Assembly has the responsibility for bus services. Because for many years, of course, the Traffic Commissioner was based in Birmingham and was regulating Wales, and that isn't right. But in getting those powers, it would be easier for the government and this assembly to ensure that the services are run in the way that we want them to be run. As regards the metro, studies are being undertaken in order to develop a business case to proceed with the metro and we are working 
with stakeholders in order to see how we can progress that project. Finally, question eight, Trianon Passmore. Howard, will the First Minister make a statement on how the Welsh NHS maintains the principle of universal free at the point of care? Well, the founding principles of the NHS to provide health services that are comprehensive, free at the point of delivery and based on equity and equality remain at the heart of the health service in Wales. Uh, thank you for that answer, First Minister. The internal market in the NHS in England has been estimated to cost up to £10 billion a year. Would you agree with me that the Welsh Labour Government commitment to having no internal market in the Welsh NHS has been of tremendous benefit for patients and that it is a commitment that will continue. I can give that uh, commitment 100%. We know that where markets have been introduced in the NHS elsewhere and that they have led to waste and inefficiency. Thank you. For